Our next topic that we will be going over, crafting iconic D2C brands, strategies for household recognition. We are having our very own Triple Whale co-founder um, joining us, Max Blank, and we have the co-founder and co-CEO of Harry's Razors, Jeff Rader. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay. These things on? Check, check. Can you hey, everybody. Welcome to the Whaley's. Ah, thanks for having me. Oh, man. Good to see is, everyone. This thing is getting a little crazy on me. Uh oh. All right, there we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming. Of course. Um, you're Good to legend, be here. A legend in the space. I don't know. Just trying to one step at a time. Um, we've got Warby Parker and Harry's, both household names. Those are amazing. Let's go. <laughs> I've got a few questions. Warby Parker, Harry's. <laughs> um, so I want to walk through a few questions. You know, different, different, uh, different feedback, different questions people have asked about how to how to really craft an iconic brand. That sounds um, great. So while you started Warby Parker, you were in business school getting your MBA? Yes. Walk us through like how you make a decision to say, I'm going to start uh, how did, a brand. How did, how did it start? Yeah. How did, you, how did you do that? An MBA to a brand? Yeah. So um, I have uh, three other co-founders at Warby Parker, and I think each of us have our own kind of story of inspiration around how we sort of got really excited about Warby Parker. Uh, for me, I was sitting in the computer lab uh, after class one day with my good friend, Neil, uh, just kind of hanging out. And another one of our friends, Dave, came up to us and said, what do you guys think about selling glasses online? And at the time, I had a really expensive pair of glasses. Uh, my prescription had changed multiple times, but I hadn't changed my glasses because they were so expensive. And my frames were like literally being held together by a piece of duct tape. And I was like, oh, I'd love a new pair of glasses. They're just so expensive. Uh, and Neil had worked in the eyewear industry uh, before coming to school uh, and was like, I've been to the place where those glasses are made. They're not that expensive. The reason they're not that expensive to make, the reason they're so expensive is because there are a couple companies that dominate the industry and there's a huge markup between how much these products cost to make uh, and how much they're sold for. I was like, no, 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 not, not me. I have like, you know, titanium frames and high index lenses. And he's like, metal and plastic. He's like, there's no reason a pair of glasses should cost as much as an iPhone. Uh, and so I went home that night and I kept playing that conversation in my head. Uh, and I was like, I couldn't sleep. And at like 1 a.m. I emailed Neil and Dave. I was like, I, I can't sleep. Like, I keep thinking about this idea. This is a good idea. Like, we should do something about this. And they emailed me right back and they're like, we've been thinking about it as well. Um, and then pretty quickly, Neil and Dave uh, and our other co-founder, Andy, uh, and I got together and we're like, let's do this. We're in business school. Let's start a business. And so, you know, we started by taking a class and writing the business plan, getting more conviction in the opportunity, talking to lots of our friends in school to understand if they felt the same way that we did. Uh, and then uh, we launched Warby Parker in 2010 in our second year of business school. Um, and from the moment we turned the site on, we were totally blown away. Um, at the time, uh, we got a lot of great press. GQ wrote an article about us in the print magazine, and that drove a tremendous amount of early traffic, wow. uh, and it was kind of off to the races from there. Incredible. And Vogue and Daily Candy and all these other things started to like talk about the brand, and then boom. And this is before like buying glasses online was a thing. Yeah, I mean, it. what was really exciting about it, for us at least, was... Um, People hadn't really bought glasses online. And we never thought of Warby Parker as a kind of direct-to-consumer site. We thought of it, uh, our website as a place to build the brand, to get to know our customers. And what I love personally was that at the, at the very early days, we were all like the customer service reps. Like we were taking all the calls and getting to know customers. And people didn't really know what to do or how to buy glasses. I remember talking to an older gentleman one day, and, he, the, and he's like, I'm trying to figure out what pair of glasses I want, and in order to get the right lenses, I need to figure out my pupillary distance, and honey, I, like, my wife, honey, just brought me a, a <laughs> ruler, and I'm measuring my pupillary distance. I was like, okay, that's helpful to know. Like, we can now 
think about how to you know help you solve that problem technically and and then you know better serve our customers that way and in, in the early days sometimes we'd have six or seven or, or eight conversations with someone to make sure that they got the right glasses and the right lenses and that they had a good experience and for me that wasn't like a cost that was an incredible opportunity to get to know our customers uh, and figure out you know how we could serve them better over over time evolve our experience to to make them happy it to be do i remember that you would pick a few and you'd send a few and then yeah 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 so um as part of the sort of process of, of building the brand uh we were talking to a lot of folks and we're like well would you do this like would you buy a brand of of glasses that you love from a design perspective that were super high quality you know online and you know, they only cost 95 dollars like you know wouldn't you want to do this and some people are like i'm not so sure uh and we're like, we're like why like that's not why isn't that awesome um like because i want to try them on um and uh, yeah, this, this is going to you know, make us sound super old and, and date us. But in 2010, a big part of Netflix's business was still sending people DVDs uh, that they got to like use and, and then send them back afterwards. And like, well, what if we just did Netflix? Like, what if we had our own a sort of a set of inventory that we would just send to people of our glasses so they could try them on at home, figure out if they liked them or not, and then, try, and then sort of send them back? Uh, and that was uh, you know, a huge unlock, I think, in our ability to then ensure that we gave people an experience that they wanted. And what was interesting from there uh, was that some people would just buy direct online and that worked great. Some people wanted to do a home try on and so we'd send them five pairs of glasses at home, they could try them on, you know, for, all happened for free, they just paid for shipping and then they'd send them back to us uh, and then could kind of choose wh wh which pair they wanted. And then some other people, like no, we want to try on the, the entire line of, of glasses that you have like, well, if you want to do that, you can come visit us in our apartments, our, which was our, where our offices in Philadelphia. People were driving like, you know, hundreds of miles to come see us in our apartments that so they could try on the full line. And we're like, huh, there's something to this. Like, maybe there is opportunity to, you know, have a, a real life experience where people could try on glasses. Today, Warby Parker, you know, has a couple hundred stores. Uh, and the sort of the first stores I think of as our apartments in, in Philadelphia where, you know, people were coming to try on glasses. And taught us a lot about who those customers were and what they wanted so that we could try to serve them better. It's incredible. I guess so shifting focus a bit right now, what made you, and how did you go from Warby Parker now over to Harry's? Yeah, so um, before going to business school, I'd worked at a private equity fund, uh, which is an amazing place, and they'd pay for me to go to business school. And so when we graduated, uh, and I was always sort of intending to go back afterwards. Uh, and so when we graduated, I said, hey, I'm going to kind of step down full-time at Warby Parker, my two co-founders, Neil and Dave, uh, were, you know, amazing people to continue to run the business moving forward, stay really closely involved at Warby Parker. I'm still on the board today, um, but I'm going to go back and work in private equity because I promised these folks I would do that, and I loved them, and I, I thought it was, you know, a, a great next sort of step in my career. And then um, I was back working in private equity, still kind of moonlighting at Warby Parker, and I I loved Warby Parker so much. I don't think I could fully appreciate how much I cared about Warby Parker until I left. Everything had kind of happened so fast. And so uh, I had this A-B test where I was kind of working on Warby Parker nights and weekends mm -hmm. and, and, and loved it so much. It didn't feel like work to me. And, and then kind of working in private equity during the week, which is an amazing job and an amazing place. I just um, you know, felt from the Warby Parker experience like I wanted to do something more. So I started having thoughts about, well, what would I want to do next? Would I want to do something like Warby Parker, where we could, you know, have huge impact on people's lives and build a brand that, you know, really resonated with them. And um, my Harry's co-founder, Andy, uh, G-chatted me one day and said, hey, uh, I just went to a, a drugstore. Um, I, I didn't have a great experience buying razor blades. I, you know, I waited for someone to unlock the case where they're you know, being held. I overpaid for my blades, the, looking at the brands and the packaging, and uh, they don't really appeal to me as a customer could you guys take what you learned at Warby Parker uh, and do it here? And uh, I remember sort of sitting back and thinking and being like, wow, it feels like I'm back at the computer lab again at business school, you know, with another idea. And that was like part of what I wanted to do. I wanted to try to, you know, build a brand that could have real impact in, in lots and lots of people's lives. And so you know, off we went to go build Harry's. Wow. And the trajectory of like getting that from zero to one after just doing Warby Parker, was that an accelerated pace? Were you able to? Yeah, I think, you know, whenever you start a company, I think um, 
you get a lot of learning. And so there was certainly a lot that I learned at Warby Parker um, and lots of relationships with great people that we had that kind of, um, you know, were applicable in the Harry's context. Got it. So Warby was bootstrapped and Harry's is venture backed. Well, we've raised venture capital into both companies over time. At Warby Parker, when we started, we were just in, in business school. Um, at Harry's, uh, yeah, we started just my co-founder and I, and then and over time we raised capital into Harry's. Um, and then we also, you know, eventually raised capital into Warby Parker. But I did have that kind of experience of living in a bootstrap company for longer uh, in the Warby Parker experience. I'm sure there's a lot of people in here that kind of want to understand the pros and cons and curious, yeah. curious your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I think every business is different. Some business ha businesses have real capital needs up front to build a product that, uh, or um, you know, want to sort of build a team early on. Uh, and others, you know, maybe have fewer capital needs. I think um, when, when talk to other founders, the advice I give is like, you know, try to be as scrappy as you possibly can to start. I think there's just tremendous value that comes from constraint. And capital is one constraint. Sure. And so if you don't have all that much capital and you've got a lot of constraints, then like that is creates a lot of focus. The scrappiness comes out. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Like it, it creates a lot. And it also you can't do a million things, right? right. You have to be focus. really focused on the very specific things that you want to do. And um, you know, throughout my time building Warby Parker first, and I think probably even thinking about the early days of Warby Parker and then Harry's over time too, it's been astounding what small teams that are very focused can accomplish. Um, and so I, I think that's probably my, my biggest piece of advice is like, hey, be super duper focused, figure out what, what you need and then kind of move forward. You know, I think some people use raising capital as a signal for like success in a business. And I think some great businesses have been built without raising capital at all. And in some ways that's like an amazing model if, if you can have it. Um, now I think there are times where businesses need capital, um, you know, as an accelerant to growth. At Warby Parker, for context, we bootstrapped the, the company. Um, we kept selling out of glasses. Um, and every time we came back online, we'd sell out again. We literally, we'd like, you know, sell a bunch of glasses, take all the money that we got from selling glasses, go buy more inventory, wait for the inventory to come, sure. bring more glasses back, and then sell out again. That seems like a reasonable use case for capital. Like we literally yeah. need enough money to keep stay in stock to service customer demand. Like that would feel like a, a, a good time. Um, but I don't think there's any right answer. And you know, it's probably no secret in, in this market environment, capital is harder to come by than it's sure. been in the past. And I think that's gonna create sort of a lot of discipline within companies to be really focused on the thing that they're building, focused on you know working with smaller teams to go make that happen in a, in a really exciting and meaningful way. I think that's a good thing. Um, For sure. So I think this is a good segue into to a story that I just kind of want to get some clarity on. Yeah. At the, at the start of Harry's, there's, there's a story that goes around that some kind of purchasing of a, of a razor blade factory in Germany. Yes. At true the start of the business? True story. So yeah, we, when we started Harry's, one of the things that was most important to us was making really, really high quality products. You know, razor blades are like a knife that you take to your face, so they better be good. Uh, and we spent a ton of time trying to figure out where could we, you know, find a partner to go make great razor blades. Uh, and we ended up finding this factory in Germany. Uh, they were uh, I think at the time, like an 80 or 90 year old factory, they had you know, hundreds of people that worked there. And um, we started working with them and you know, they, they made our first blades. We launched the brand, um, things were going pretty well. And you know, we went back and said, hey, we, we want to you know, have, be able to sell more products. Um, and owning this for us is, is critical. I mean, it's, it's an important part of our product line and it was, you know, manufacturing razor blades is a pretty highly specialized thing. Um, so when we were less than a year old, uh, we, uh, we bought the factory. Um, and you know, for me, it was a wild experience. Like I remember right after we bought the factory, we were there standing on these wood crates overlooking the entire factory floor. You know, there was like 500 people there. I was like, holy shit, this is more people than I've ever, ever seen before, had to ever talk to before. Uh, and, um, 
you know, we were speaking in English, they were translating in German, we didn't really know what was going on. And at the end, there was kind of like this, like, you know, <laughs> little bit of applause. We're like, okay, I guess we're going to do this. Um, and, you know, it was really funny when we were working with them uh, and we were kind of negotiating to buy the factory, we would email them um, and then they would email each other uh, and then, um, you know, kind of forward the email back. So immediately what we would do is take that email and put it into Google Translate and figure out like what they were saying. And like the emails were like, the American internet boys, American <laughs> internet cowboys uh, are interested in X, Y, Z. And we're like, yeah, here we are. Um, um, and, uh, but I think, you know, for us, and I think this is probably a lesson for any, any founder in any situation, you know, one of the things that we um, felt really, that was really important um, was to build trust there uh, and respect. And the way that we felt like we could do that was to say, hey, we're gonna do X, Y, Z, and then to follow through and actually do those things. Uh, and I think over, over time in doing that, you know, I think um, we built a lot of trust uh, with, with the team there. Um, and people sometimes ask me like, well, would you do that in my business? Should I buy a manufacturing plant or, or vertically integrate? Um, and I think that depends, you know, Warby Parker, there are a bunch of incredible partners who we work with who can make really, really high quality glasses. We can kind of own the design process and the inspiration, understand the customer, know what's working, drive merchandising, but then rely, but then work with great third parties to mm -hmm. go do that. In razors and blades, it's a very specialized thing, which is why we felt like it was important to own manufacturing. Got it. Very, very interesting story. Yeah. Um, yeah. You wouldn't think that that's like the first move you do in the first year, right? No, no. And I think it depends on like what's most important in your business. Um, you know, I think for, I've always believed and you know, we talked about this a little bit before, backstage before that like having incredible products is just critical to any business. Like, you know, you want to have products that people love. And so when we thought about that, it's like, well, wh where should we be investing? Well, invest in making incredible products. Uh, and, you know, I think that was, I learned that. Uh, at Warby Parker, and I, you know, I think that's a, a really uh, probably transferable lesson across you know businesses. It's like, what are the core products that people are going to use? How are they going to feel about those products? And let's just make sure that we make things that that people really love. What, what, what do you think was like the biggest unlock for kind of owning that end to end, having having the the manufacturing lockdown? Like, what was the biggest impact from a, from a business standpoint? Um, I, I think. Um, in any situation, um, it's valuable to be able to understand who your customer is and then sort of translate that back into the, the thing that you make. And so, you know, one of the great things about direct to consumer is that you get a ton of feedback super fast from yeah. customers. Uh, and then to be able to say, okay, this is what a customer wants. And then I can translate that back into the thing that I'm providing them. There's a ton of value in that, uh, and I think that um, because, like, ultimately, we're just trying to make people happy with our products at the end of the day. And so, um, you know, in any business, I think being able to rapidly iterate on the product that your customer is using, sometimes iteration, you know, with physical goods especially, can't be as rapid. Uh, and then take that back to the customer, say, hey, you asked for this, am I delivering? Yes, X, Y, y yes, and I want these other things, and then go back is important. And obviously you can't just only listen to people say, you wanna to listen to what they say, and then build things that inspire them. But, um, but I think there is a lots of, of, of value in doing that for, for people. It's really owning, owning that feedback loop and having the control over what's being delivered. Super helpful. Awesome. So finally, is there anything you can, you can really share here from your playbook of, of DDC success? Yeah, well, I think like first, um, you know, I, at Warby to start, um, and then over time with Harry's too, we never saw ourselves building just like a direct-to-consumer business. Like DDC wasn't an end into itself. We were trying to build brands that people loved. Um, mm -hmm. And I think DDC is an amazing place to build a brand. Uh, if you think about it, you can control every single touch point, uh, which is super helpful. You can get all the data on what customers want and like and need. Um, Triple Whale you know, is an amazing place to help you start to get that data and really learn 
Um, you can think about what messages work for customers in the world and test it or that quickly. Uh, and you can have the high touch customer service experiences and, and learn from customers that way and have thousands and millions of conversations with people uh, over time to really dial that in and measure all that data and then have all the verbatims too, which are so helpful to be like, okay, gosh, like this is what people really want. Um, you know, back to like the, the conversation around, you know, a guy with a ruler, it's like, okay, I wonder if there's a better way than a ruler to sort that, that problem out for him. Like, let's think about what information we can provide on the site that, that will be really helpful there. Um, and so I think that that's awesome. Uh, and I think then, you know, by doing that, what, what you can do is start to build a really loyal sort of group of folks. And, and I think in the most extreme situations, you can stop becoming some monolithic brand or company and start being a group of people who actually want to help somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, now, like, it's not just that, you know, I, I buy glass from Morby Parker, but like, I talked to the founder because, he, you know, he was answering the phone that day and I got to know him and hear his story. And he actually is like, dedicated and motivated to making my experience better. And I think there is like a tremendous amount uh, of value there. And then uh, as you do that, you can start to iterate on everything. You can iterate on the direct-to-consumer experience, iterate on your advertising and marketing to make sure that that's resonant. You can iterate on um, the messages. You can iterate on how you talk to people afterwards, uh, after they buy, uh, and build a really loyal kind of following and community for your brand. And, and, and so, you know, given that opportunity, I've always thought that that was an incredible place to start and build a brand. And then over time, what happens is you, you learn from customers naturally, like, well, how else do they want to access or buy your product? At Warby Parker, you know, the example I gave, like, people were driving to Philadelphia to try on our glasses and we're like, wow, there's a huge insight there. Uh, okay, uh, now we know what, what people really want. And so uh, we can then, you know, build real life experiences for them that ended up, you know, being in stores. And then what's exciting about that model is then you're, then now you have multiple nexuses to, to, to reach your customer, and how and where they want to shop. And you can take all the continued feedback and learning on direct to consumer, all sort of the, the halo that you're building on the brand and in terms of marketing and continue to iterate on that experience, launch new things there really quickly to see, hey, do, do people like that? And then make those things available for people across lots and lots of different touch points, how and where they want it. So, you know, I think D2C is still, you know, an amazing place, it always will be an amazing place to, to build brands. And I think the data that you get, to, you know, that, you know, we talked a lot about this, the data that you get on your customer and who they are and what they want, and not just one customer, but thousands and thousands of customers, you know, gives you an incredible roadmap to figure out how to serve them better. Amazing. That is all my questions. Cool. We are wrapping it up. All right. Well, well, well that, that sounds so, great. <laughs> so from Warby Parker to Harry's, amazing. Is there any uh, last sort of yeah, tidbits? I, mean, I think like for me, the other thing I just say is like, and I'm sure there's lots of founders here and people who work in early stage environments, like um, it's hard. It's a it's a hard job. Yeah. I mean, you, you know hard. this too. It's, it's a hard journey. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, for me, when people are like, well, should I start a company? I'm like, if you're like super motivated about it, if you literally like wake up thinking about it and go to sleep thinking about it, um, then at some point you're just going to be compelled to go do it. Like you're going to have no other choice. Uh, and I think that that's, um, you know, something that I've found to be like really gratifying. And then that makes it all, and, and all worth it. When, when you're not thinking about it, when you're not waking up, to be able to push through yeah. to, keep, to keep going, right? Like, yeah, yeah, totally. I think that that's like, that, that's what matters, you know? And, I, and, and I, I think for us across our business, you know, our, our mission at Harry's is to create things people like more. And I just view our impact as like, well, how many people can we reach? And how much better can we make their experience? And, you know, if we can reach a lot of people and, and make their experiences a lot better then I, then I think we're going to have real impact in the world. And so, um, that's how I think about it, you know? And I, I think that for, for all of y'all, as you think about all the businesses that are sitting in this room, like you're probably having a lots of amazing positive impact on people. And so I think that's the, the payoff for, for all the hard work. hundred percent. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you all. It's great to be with y'all. Ah, uh, it's... <laughs>